directors for the GLBT Historical Society. So what I will very briefly share with you is the spirit of the show was to share with each other um, what gives us hope and what helps us to build resilience. And that um, much of our history is told through um, the prism of places like bars, like Esta Noche, Lengue Bonita, places in the TL, or through events like the Compton's Riot, Stonewall, um, other really prominent events, but often not through love and, and not through relationships and um, in ways that explain how we overcome and how we actually build happiness and love. And so that show um, was really about breaking down the unit of measurement, kind of, of, or like recalibrating the idea of what is it that we're documenting, what is it that we're doing, and for me, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's small circles of friends, it's community networks, and then it's us mobilizing on very large um, levels. And tonight's panel um, follows in that vein, in that the panelists here are each very important contributors to the Bay Area's um, LGBTQ Latinx activism, arts, poteria, magic, and tonight's facilitation is going to be done by Shane, um, who is an emerging leader in our community. And Shane's going to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. So thankful for the opportunity. Thank you, Tina. I'll be moderating the conversation today. And today we're here to talk about what some of Tina mentioned. Um, this is a group of Latinx leaders, and we're going to learn together about some of the work they've done and maybe bring up topics around how we can keep doing that work and how we can uh, face some of the challenges that our community might be facing. Uh, a little about me. So like I said, my name is Shane. I moved out here maybe five or six years ago, and my goal was just to come to school, but I quickly learned that there's so much that this community feeds me. Um, as an individual, as an artist, as a, you know, just as a human, you know, there's a lot to San Francisco to connect with. So um, I've been able to thrive out here in a lot of ways. I've worked with the transgender, uh, the Office of Transgender Initiatives, we're doing work to make lives for transgender people easier. Um, I've participated in the Compton's Cafeteria Riot play. Uh, we're lucky to have the presence of the author of that play. Uh, thank you for being here, Donna Persona. Um, um, and I'm also a performer in the Bay Area. I perform as the pop-up drag queen. And what that is, is a project just bringing drag into the streets, making it family friendly, making it approachable, and then at times making it a statement of activism. Um, so thank you for having me here today. I'm gonna pass the mic on to our panelists and give them a chance to talk a little bit about um, just a quick little bio, and then we can maybe get started on the conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Foxy Blue Orchid, and uh, my, my muggle alter ego uh, is Dino Fox. I moved to the Bay Area three years ago um, as uh, working with Thousand Currents, which is a foundation that works funding food sovereignty, climate justice, and solidarity economy in Latin America, Asia, the Pacific Islands, and Africa. And I am also a published author through Guarima Press, which is based here in San Francisco. Um, that is headed up by my um, editor-in-chief and uh, chosen familia, Lorenzo Rerai Lozano. So we'll talk probably a little bit about that and the roots that I have coming from Texas living here now. Um, Foxy Blue Orchid is also a nationally presented burlesque performer, producer, and MC. 
I am a member of Sin Sisters Burlesque in Santa Cruz, which is the whitest fucking place I've ever performed. <laughs> and it is really, really exciting to do rancheras and mariachi music in front of them and make sure that they know how Latinx I am. And also being able to move through spaces here in San Francisco that our, our landscape changes constantly and the people kind of get whiter and whiter every time. And it's so exciting to be able to just fuck up spaces and uh, be exactly who I am no matter where I am. Hi everyone, my name is Luis Gutierrez Mock. I am a queer biracial, Chicano white uh, trans guy. And I'm originally from San Jose, so I've got to hold it down for those of us from the Bay. Um, even, even being from the South Bay now still means something. <laughs> um, I have been doing queer, trans, Latinx organizing for 20 years. Um, so like, I, I think with Angel, I think we've known each other for probably most of that time. Uh, I've done a lot of organizing together. Um, I work currently at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health at UCSF. I'm the project director for the Triumph Triumphal Project. We are a um, transgender prep demonstration project with clinic sites at La Clinica in Oakland and also at Gender Health Center in Sacramento. And in my um, free time, I'm finishing my PhD. And in my procrastination for that, I am a bachata dancer. And I'm getting ready. <laughs> That's so much more fun than my dissertation. <laughs> I'm getting ready to compete uh, for the second time at the World Latin Dance Cup, which is going to be in Colombia this year. Um, my name is uh, Jesse James Johnson. I'm originally from Texas. I'm the son of a Swedish rancher and a strong willed mixed American woman, mother of 12. I have deep you know, spiritual, political, cultural roots in the Chicano and, 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 and queer liberation movements. Um, I, um, I'm a poet, and I'm currently, I'm, I'm working in the Tenderoid, I'm an activist in the Tenderoid. I've been there for the last, you know, 20 years, I think, almost. Um, one of the co-founders of the San Francisco Drug Union Fearman, one of the on the board of, uh, of Hospitality House, and, uh, and, and the very soon at the TNBC and the Tenderoid, and there we go. And I just wish a little more got an award from something called the Kid and Jones Project. I'm not sure you guys know about that. It's a uh, project uh, uh, you know, they, there, there was a study done that shows that there are more artists living in the Tenderloin than here you know, in the city. Now, not, there are not a lot of artists in the, in the conventional sense, it's not a regular you know, art school at times, but people who are actually doing art, whether it be you know, for healing or revelation or whatever they're, they're doing it. So now there's an award ceremony that happens every two years about Kid and Jones. My name is Tina, and I'm happy that y'all are here tonight. And I'm going to give the mic back to Shane. All right, well, thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to learn a little bit about all of you and be inspired to do the work I do through some of the things you've done as well. Um, so one question I have, um, Chicano is kind of a word that's new to me. I don't know too much about that word. So I want to hear a little bit about what that word might mean to you um, and how it relates to some of the word work that you guys do. Oh, me first, okay. Um, well, for me, living in South Texas for the most of my life, um, it meant living in a region where the border crossed my family, not the other way around, I feel. So for me, being born um, in an, an indigenous area of South, of South Texas, which used to be Mexico, came with a lot of uh, com like complexity, I think, which is really interesting. So for me, it's simply, um, it's not just a, an identity that kind of talks about my family lineage, but it's also a political identity. And so moving through Chicanex, um, X sort of uh, spaces has always been politicized in a way that empowers um, being able to embrace both sides of that identity, I think. I can't really remember, I can't remember the first time I ever heard the word Chicano or Chicana. Um, my mom organized with Cesar Chavez um, in the 60s and did a lot um, with UFW. My family were migrant farm workers. Um, and, you know, I think that that was, that, that was really important to her. Uh, side note, Cesar Chavez pissed her off, and so she stopped organizing with them. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I am her child. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that I think that that's always been there. Um, and also, I think for me, that uh, 
sort of my racial identity formation came about at the same time as my uh, sexual orientation and gender identity formation. Like all of that sort of occurred together because um, the, the shift that happened when I came out also happened with my racial identity because I was really coming to terms with what it meant to be mixed race, what it meant to be Chicano, what it meant, um, you know, to have, to be able to, to say that I, I am these things, which was also when I was in college, which I think is sometimes when, you know, when some Chicanx folks get, get politicized in certain ways. Um, it's definitely not the story for everybody. Um, so I think that for me, it's, it's really intrinsically tied um, not only to the history of my family, the history of organizing within my family, it's also tied to me being queer, to me being trans. Um, so, so all of that together for me is what it means to be um, to be Chicano. I do remember the first time I heard the word Chicano. I was 13 years old, and uh, one of my teachers gave me a little button that was uh, uh, it looked like a you know, I can't remember because it was actually a bus of but make sure you speak up. It was actually a, a, a button for a, a political party called La Las Unidas which is in Texas. And at the time, you know, Chicano really just means or, that refers to people who are of Mexican, of Mexican descent who are born on the side of the border. You know, uh, it has, you know, it, it when when it first became uh, popular use, it was it was used as a way to distinguish oneself from from the other term, which is Mexican American. But I remember before we even had Mexican American. I remember when we, we had you know, we were Spanish, you know, Spanish and we were polite, Mexican, met Mexican. If you were, you know, they were being impolite, they kind of spit it at you when they said it. You know. And then as, I remember in third grade, I still have a picture of, of some girl sign that went by and it says, to a good Mexican boy, e -E M-E-S-K-I-N. And so we were kind of, you know, we were groping for a, you know, a, a word. And so when Chicano came about, we, we jumped on it. More actively, probably, you know, I'm a Dejano. Uh, I still use the word Chicano just because it's, you know, it, it has historically been, a, it, they've, uh, they've attacked that word ever since it, it became popular. And to the, you know, and you know, and they're still tagging it today, and so you know, I, I claim it. I'm curious uh, to hear from you, Shane, your response to what we're sharing, um, because I know you're you're not, uh, you do not identify as Chicano, Chicano, Chicano. Chica, you're not Chicano, but um, what I'll share is that um, I did grow up with uh, a Chicano identity. I'm from Logan Heights in San Diego, and. I connected with activism as in kindergarten, we had a march in my neighborhood for um, Chicano Park and to, uh, to make sure, Jesse has um, laughed at this for years because of all, out of all the activism, all we got was uh, a park that used to be a junkyard. And fuck you, Jesse. So um, but the truth is that um, um, environmental justice and social justice has caught up to what we were doing, what I, what I was doing as a kindergartner, which was uh, my elementary had um, parts of our playground blocked off because it was um, zoned industrial and residential, which only happens somehow with people of color communities. And that part of our playground when our school had budget cuts, they rented out part of the playground to the industrialists who put their canisters of chemicals in on the playground. And um, so even though like, okay, it's kind of funny we got a park out of it. The truth is that it was the beginning of uh, environmental justice movements. And I'm, I'm happy that um, I, I have that as my roots, but I'm also happy to, to note that the term Chicano, Chican, Chicanex, Chicana, is outdated, and that Latinx is a more embracing, um, so that, let's say if you would have gotten here 20 years ago, or let's say when I got here in the 80s, um, the idea that I, we would have to have a conversation around how we actually are of one unit, whereas now um, there's a shorthand to that, um, in that Latinx, is more inclusive in terms of gender, in terms of nationality, in terms of backgrounds. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your take on this too. So I guess I definitely relate to the term uh, Latinx. Uh, for me, my family is from the Caribbean and they're from an island, or excuse me, 
they, they are off the island of um, Kikafer, which is connected to Belize, the country is Belize. Um, and the culture there is very mixed, actually. Um, we have influences from the Caribbean, and we are the only British ruled uh, country in Central America, so we spoke English. Um, but all the other Latin countries surrounded us, so that poured in. And it was, it's a beautiful country, you know? It's a blend of all of these different cultures, and I relate to that culture. My family comes more from the uh, Mayan uh, and Spanish, like from Spain backgrounds. I unfortunately don't know too much about my Spanish backgrounds, um, but in terms of my family in Belize, they've lived there for so many years. The Zaldivar is my last name. Um, go back and my, my dad's side, I unfortunately don't know too much about my father, um, but his roots are in Belize as well. But for me here, living in the United States, knowing the different uh, things that a person of color faces here in the United States, I really identified with Latinx um, identity um, because I'm very rooted in my culture and I want to represent that uh, in everything that I do really. Like when I present anything to the table, I, that, that's just a part of me. Um, so it's nice to hear like from the panelists from you guys that that's a part of the work you do as well, you know, bringing your culture into the work that you do. Um, and you know, San Francisco is a really interesting place. Like I'm from Florida and also from Belize, but I have not ever seen organizing the way it happens here. You know, there's a lot of people who make a out loud, verbal, and action-oriented effort to be like, I want to organize. I want to uh, create space. I want to find community. And for me, the first place that that happened wasn't necessarily uh, Latinx or originated, it was just queer originated. The first time I stepped foot in the city, I remember I was just walking down Market. That was just like the first thing I got to do, it's the main street. And I will never forget the first time I saw the LGBT center. Uh, rainbow flags, I was like, oh, I'll go, I'll go find out if they have Wi-Fi. That was my thought. <laughs> I was, I've never been in a space like that before. An LGBT center, that blew my mind. I was like, I need to check a Craigslist ad for housing. Let me go see if I can borrow their Wi-Fi. I go in and I'm blown away. You know, it's like, wow, there's a space that exists for this specific purpose. Um, and now, years later, I see that that's something that I'm sure it exists in other places, but the fact that it's here always blows my mind. Like there are people organizing to make spaces for so many different types of communities. Um, I'm wondering, um, a lot of you have been involved in different types of spaces, like um, Luis with the uh, Triumph Project, um, you know, Ella, Jesse. I want to know kind of what drew you to being a part of making those spaces possible? I'm assuming you're talking about Reto, you know. Um, uh, for example, Sida Por Vida, which it was an organization that used to sit here for a key Latino lesbian health project. Um, I, did, I didn't necessarily found it, that organization. I love the, the name and the, the, the program design were my invention, you know. Um, I really wrote the first proposal for it. The, uh, it, was, it was actually, I did so under the, because uh, I was instructed to do so by my boss at the time, who was Reggie Williams. And, uh, Reggie Williams was uh, the director of an organization called the National Task Force on AIDS Prevention. It was a, uh, and, and, and they were the lead agency for something called the, the Gay Men of Color, you know, uh, uh, AIDS Consortium, you know, which was a, a coalition of, 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 of four or five organizations uh, that were by and for uh, a game of color who had to essentially wrestle away control of funds and, and, and in control to, uh, uh, so they could have their own organizations. An uh, important component of that, of that call the consortium was, uh, was something called CURA, so the Unidad Unida and the Small de Sida, which was founded by Rodrigo Reyes. And if Rodrigo Reyes is probably 
you know, and I say this without exaggeration or hyperbole, probably the most important gay Latino leader of the 20th century. He was the, the, the founder of GALA, which is Gay Alliance of Latin America, uh, Latin Americans, which was the first gay Latino organization in U.S. history. Uh, he was the founder of Curas, who was a, a charming man, tall, handsome, he was a, a, a theater a actor and a director. Anyway, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Rio died, he died of AIDS, uh, the community, it, it tore a piece of the community's heart out. And there was, there was a, a, a tremendous strife and fighting, and, and, it was, and, and, and essentially they tore Agudas apart, the organization of Agudas apart. Agudas is important to the British coalition, right? Because they, they, they're giving money based upon the fact that, you know, on the premise that they had this coalition of, of organizations that were, that were, that were you know, grassroots, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So these, there were still some contracts left over that needed to be addressed. Reggie Williams and, and Dr. Sandra Hernandez got together and decided that what, what we needed, what, what we needed to happen is we needed a new gay Latino organization. So my background had been in community organizing. Uh, I've I only been here less, oh, just over a year, uh, but because my background was in, was in community organizing as opposed to administration, they chose me to, to, to direct that project. And, um, and, and along with my co-worker, I should say, that Juan Rodríguez, who is an amazing, amazing person, beautiful, beautiful young man, who's, who's, who's death I would never get over. Um, so anyway, we're, we're thrown into this, this kind of shattered landscape of, of this, this kind of like this gay Latino universe that's centered around 16th and Valencia. And what we did in that first month was, that was we interviewed 37 different people about their whole situation, you know, gay, gay men and AIDS, et cetera, et cetera. And what, we, what I heard over and over again was that gay Latinos were alcoholic, we were closeted, we were cowards, we, you know, we, you know, we, we practiced unsafe sex, and it's just that we were doomed, you know? And some of those, in fact, were factors in the fact that we had such a high you know, rate of, of, of AIDS infection. But the problem was that many of the, of the, of the uh, AIDS educators and operators, that, that was the mes message they were conveying to, to those people. You know, they were telling them, not only are you out, you're, you're alcoholic, and, uh, you know? And so we, did, we came up with a, with a campaign that, to contradict some of the, those things. And it was a campaign based upon the fact that it, it, it was it said the gay, gay young men that our lives were about, you know, we were courageous, passionate, and our lives were full of small miracles. And we, and we had a series of, of, of educational workshops that, that to, to, to try to convey that message. We had a, a wonderful writing workshop. We had a workshop on, on tratado making. I'm not sure if people know what tratados are, but essentially when you're saved from it, like if you have an accident and you, 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 it's, it's a miracle you, you survive it, you're obliged to paint a, a picture but to, to a, whatever saint you help your name is. We had one of those uh, things. We had a, a, a uh, uh, the classes for uh, atrevidas, which is for, for you know, transgender individuals, where they learn not only how to be drag performers, but also you know, you know, health and hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so um, so that, that's how most found it. Thank you, Jesse. I, I think um, what I can add is that I've worked at Curas uh, uh, before its demise. And I was a part of the Gay Men of Color Consortium um, before Jesse got you, before you got here from, from Texas. And what I can share is that um, what often gets told in the Bay Area or the, the United States in, in the queer context is that AIDS decimated the Castro and AIDS decimated um, white gay men. And for what I can share is that the decimation on 16th Street and in a queer Latino context um, came a little later, and it was not in the Castro, because the Castro often, in the um, 70s and 80s, I got here in the mid-80s, um, would ask for like two, three IDs. Um, if you were not pretty and young, I was pretty and young, but um, <laughs> so I, I did get into all the bars, and the bartenders did, you know, serve me, but like some of my friends did not, they did not get in, I had to, like, it was a thing. And um, why I share this is because I've lived on 16th Street since I got here. Um, and that um, the decimation is really difficult to describe. Uh, I live at 16th, on 16th by church, and Curas was at 16th and Dolores. Um, I was a part of the creation of Mission Neighborhood Health Centers, Trinidad Esperanza. 
and that's on shop 60s in Shopwell. And Gudas, or rather Gala, used to have the Prisma Awards at the Victoria Theater. And for me, um, the gay, Latino, and Diane Felix used to have colors on Valencia and Amelia's, and, um, and the bars were mixed on market. So the Eagle Creek was a black African-American India bar that, um, where we were welcome. And there were lots of businesses, legal and illicit, on 16th Street. And the sad thing is that um, what Jesse's describing of Proyecto was sort of like when a, a, a beautiful new creature comes out of something that's supposed to be dead. And that um, it, it, and people try to stomp it out, and people try to just keep us in our place. And um, what Jesse Jesse is humble in that he's not concentrating on um, how much blood, sweat, and tears it took to make that happen, and um, and that it was violent. The the um, when when Jesse said that we had to take away money, it was. I was one of the people, I work at Shanti now, but in those days, I was the chair of the Latino Coalition on AIDS, and we literally were taking money away from the AIDS Foundation, from Shanti, there used to be AIDS Health Project, and Stop AIDS. Those were our enemies. And they now, uh, I, I work at Shanti, I know we all benefit from programs, um, from some of those groups. I'm happy about where we're at now, but I, I'm also happy to say um, that I was a part of the redistribution of funds because not all of us are here today, but some of us are, and it was in part because of those um, radical actions. Um, so I, I think for me, some of the, the, the genesis around the organizing work that I've done um, is really around survival, both individual and community survival. Um, and this is a, like the, the large theme from one of my dissertation papers. I did interviews with um, transgender women of color peer intervention staff uh, from nine demonstration sites across the United States uh, that were all working on interventions for trans women of color, color living with HIV. And um, my main finding is that uh, the reason why people are engaging in the work that, that they're engaging in is for individual and community level survival. Um, for myself, it's because, you know, from like age 10 to 20, basically my entire adolescence, I didn't know what was going on with me. There was no transgender, um, you know, the people didn't talk about trans issues. There was like maybe a couple trans, there were trans people on Jack Jerry Springer. <laughs> and then, you know, that was it. That was, that was it. That was really it. There was trans people, like, you know, maybe like walking around, you would see, you would see trans people depending on uh, what area you were in or how late you were out at night. Um, and so I was highly suicidal from, until I was 20 years old when I came out. And I got a, like, I came out and I was like, what do I do now? I want to go and be gay. And so I found Lyric and I was gay. <laughs> and I, you know, I joined the Lyric Queer Youth Talk Line. I volunteered there for five years until. Um, I aged out and then I kind of got gently pushed out because I was too old. Um, you know, I, I, did a, I did a lot of organizing with queer Latinx communities. Um, I did organizing uh, once Proyecto closed. I worked with um, Proyecto Lucha for a little while while that was, that was still kind of going on. Um, and I, I've done a lot of work with the San Francisco Trans March. I think I did eight years with Donna working on the San Francisco Trans March. We worked, we, we created a um, Queer Latinx Pride event. I really wish somebody would bring that back. It was so cute. It was in the park. We had a stage. Mama Dora was an MC. She was a huge mess. Um, <laughs> she like almost, well, at one time I was convinced she was going to tear down the entire stage because there was a pole. And she decided she was going like, to swing herself around it and pole dance with it. And it was, that was great. But you know, I think that uh, all of the all of the work that I've done, and um, you know, all of all of the organizing that I've done has really been around um, finding myself and finding community that um, I, I can I can share friendship with that that will be there for me. Um, you know, and it's it's really been it's been very fulfilling, and it's been very much tied to all aspects of my identities. Um, and so I think I think that 
really it's about survival and, and resilience, but you know, thinking through survival as being a celebration of, of ourselves of, and of our communities. Thank you. Um, and I agree with a lot of like what you said. I think like for people who utilize the services or for the communities that those organizations organizations serve, there's a sense of belonging or a sense of feeling like you know you're not alone in the journey. You know, in so many aspects. Whether you know if you are Latinx, you know the reality is there are oppressions that we face in the world. Um, so when we have access to services or community organizing, it gives us a chance, or it makes me feel like it gives us a chance to um, tackle that together. You know, if we have each other, we can collaborate to, you know, use each other's skills to keep the community unified, to keep us growing into learning, you know, how are we going to fight um, oppression or how are we going to make more opportunities ourselves um, and maybe I want to talk more about that like um, like I know that you do a lot of wonderful artwork um, even beyond the Bay Area you know I want to know how you incorporate your artwork to convey those stories you know you're reaching communities who don't necessarily know about um, the Latinx community like you mentioned um, what has your experience been with that Thank you. So one of the great things about having my work published is that I get to go and travel to universities all over the country, which has been amazing. Universities that I wouldn't have gotten into if I applied. Um, and so one of the interesting things for me is that I don't necessarily, I think I'm more, I'm more excited by the number of people who are drowning in white literature in their universities, just feeling like, holy shit, there's someone writing poetry about tortillas. Like, they get to see themselves for a brief moment, and those kids do everything for me. They, like, have little after parties, and they, like, give me champagne because they follow me on Instagram, and they know what I drink, and, like, it just becomes, like, this breath of fresh air for them, and I'm like, okay, I'll get on Tinder while I'm here and see what's going on, because I'm there for a minute. But yeah, no, I think it's been really, I think the part of the feedback that is really most inspiring for me is when people recognize themselves in my work, which I don't know that I, I think that my art is my survival, so I don't always really think about what the impact will be. I think um, for me it's about expressing the trauma that lives in this body that I'm not even 100% happy with all the time. You know, and so I think one of the interesting things for me also are that there are people who talk about being moved by my work that I never, but they were not anywhere near who I was writing for. You know, there are individuals who see themselves in me, and you know, there are young girls who are in, you know, some of these like under, like these um, like sophomore literature classes, and they are like, you know, I'm Italian and I'm Mexican and I'm just really hairy and I'm gonna stop shading now because you know I feel like hearing you talk about how I don't have to change how I look in order to feel glamorous and to feel sparkly and to be beautiful and to own that about myself um, was really important and so those those little moments are really inspiring to me because I I, I think once it's vocalized I definitely I identify sure of course there's some similarities and I can kind of see how my presentation of gender and art, um, and I've started to show up like this in universities more, which I think, like I was, I don't know how true it is, but apparently I'm the first drag queen to walk in shoes across Hamilton College, like to get to where I was like speaking. Um, and again, those students, like they, they, it was like a, it was like my residency was like this like celebration, it was like a holiday for them. They got to like, experience queer culture in a way that they don't get to present like this for one it's like snowing half the time so they're not obviously I, it was snowing when i got there i was still wearing six inch heels i'm just gonna say but um you know they're a little bit more bundled up and um, they just have so much fun they just really really so for me um yeah i think oftentimes what ends up happening also i feel is is like energy work like, I just do it for myself, and I do it because for a long time, right, I was reading poetry, and I was reading stories about 
white men in the 70s and the Castro, like there was no way for me to see myself in any of that literature. And so my chosen familia are artists and they're poets and they're writers. And so they were the ones who taught me the importance of documenting my history and making sure that my voice was there. And then in turn, getting to see individuals like step into their own power. And usually the, the professors will, will share like screenshots of the reports that they write, which people write reports about me, which I think is the weird, like I, I disappoint my parents like on a weekly basis, but somehow there's like these students gaining these degrees and they're, they're dissecting my work in a way that um, when I was crying over my tacos at 3 a.m. and like writing these things because I didn't know where else to put that information to get it out of my heart and out of my head so things would quiet down, I never thought that it would really liberate other people. That's really, it's been really blessed. Like I've been really blessed in that way. Um, I think visibility is so important for our communities. You know, visibility and like you said, documentation, recognition, um, you know, a lot, the reality is a lot of things go unrecognized and history can get lost that way. You know, we're still digging into history um, for queer culture, like for example, Compton. You know, Compton was something that really only people here knew, you know, and then later it took the work of uh, Susan Stryker to investigate that show. This was a movie was something that needs to be shared in regards to the queer liberation movement, you know. So the fact that I'm hearing that, you know, they're documenting the work you're doing, that is important. You know, it's important, at least in my eyes, to know that there's going to be access for somebody who's on that journey of trying to find themselves, you know, trying to figure out, like, what am I going through, what's happening in this body, whether it's trauma, queerness, having something to relate to, it, I think is so important. Um, so to know that they're documenting this, I hope that there's a little kid out there, you know, that one day runs into something like this and goes, wow, I see that, you know? Um, because the reality for a lot of communities is that they might not have that. You know, if you grew up in somewhere like Florida, you know, I'm thankful I was surrounded by different Latin people. I was in South Florida. But, you know, there really wasn't access to queer things. And, you know, the internet has its bad parts, but it also has its good parts, where it's like, you know, for some people, you could type something on YouTube and they might find a picture or a documentation of, you know, queerness. Um, so I'm really excited to hear that, you know, they're documenting that work. I think visibility is so important for our communities today. I know that you're, um you, you have your own activism around your pop-up drag, and in terms of your work with the um, with the mayor's office of uh, uh, trends, I forget the whole name of it. Is it um, um, Office of Transgender Initiatives? Transgender Initiatives. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what does that mean um, that the city helped you, and if you could describe what happened. Um, for people who don't know about about that and how um, the, the outcome, what does that mean for you in terms of plugging into community and, and looking at the future? Thank you. So I, I'm guessing you mean that instance where I had to fight the city. Got it. So there was a moment in time with my pop-up drag scene um, so what I explained the project, I basically do public performances of drag. And I was doing it in front of the Ferry building for quite some time, but there were instances that the police came. And these experiences were not pleasant. They were not as bad as they could have been. But for me, of course, you know, interacting with the police as a trans person, as a person of color, there was fear and you know, also just trying to be in my head with the fact that, OK, I know my rights. Um, so the police came and they stopped me. At no point did they get physical, at no point did they arrest me, but they basically told me, oh, you can't be here. Which is, you know, based on history, that's usually been their excuse for most of their actions. You can't be here, whether it's for whatever reason. 
So at that point, I was in such a struggle because this was a source of income for me. You know, the $100 I might make makes a difference in this city. And also, um, I knew that that was wrong. I have every right to be there. I was not uh, blocking traffic. And I learned after the fact that there is no permit that exists in the city for a street performer of any kind. Whether you want to use a speaker or not, doesn't exist. So in other words, it doesn't matter. I wanted to fight that fight with as much, uh, how do I say? I wanted to make sure I fought that fight as, not correctly, but like almost professionally. I wanted to have all of my sites sourced. I wanted to have people behind my back to make that fight happen. And so I reached out to the Office of Transgender Initiatives. I had worked with them in the past. I was like, look, this is a government body. Um, I need your help to represent me in this issue if possible. And Claire Farley, the director of that office, emailed the Fisherman's Wharf, or the, the port authorities, I should say. I had gone to the port authorities at least two or three other times to say, hey, this is happening, how can I resolve this? Didn't really pay me any mind, oh, the, 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 you know. And then Claire sent an email. Claire sent an email with a .gov email. They were in the same ballpark. And so then they took me seriously. And that's kind of the amazing thing about where we are today. You know, obviously we're still fighting a lot of fights, but the reality is we have an office of transgender initiatives and it's a government body. You know, so many trans women die, or trans people die, not knowing that was going to ever happen. So we're in a groundbreaking time. Um, but they were able to set up a meeting. We did not a mediation, but kind of like a sit down. And we went into that meeting saying, I'm going to keep doing this because it's my right. And they were like, oh my God, we're so sorry you had to go through all this trouble. I'm like, all right, thank you. I was civil about it. I was like, okay. I'll see you out there in my sparkly dress in about five minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, if you want to support the project, and I've had a lot of support from people in this room, thank you so much. Um, you know, the, the pop up drag queen has a Venmo, has a PayPal, but also has some social media. I need to do a little bit more work on that. But, um, all the money for this project goes towards so much. I think it's such a great performance piece. Um, one thing I'm currently working on too, um, I'm going to Mexico, Mexico, uh, Puebla, and I'm going as an artist, as a pop-up drag queen. So I'm going with uh, 17 different San Francisco artists and we're presenting a project called La Diaspora. Um, a lot of the people performing are of Latinx origin and the idea is that we're going back to our roots and presenting culture in a uh, Latin space. Um, so this project, we're going in November. We got grants, we got housing. We'll be there for four days, and the pop-up drag queen is gonna be there. So if you want to support this project, she's at the bottom of her lipstick, and she is scraping the corners. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yes. Um, that's the pop-up drag queen, that's the work I've done. But like I was mentioning, I'm very thankful for the Office of Transgender Initiatives. The reality is these types of bodies or organizations that exist are, are a resource for our community. You know, it's, it's good to know that these types of projects exist um, so we have somewhere to go. And I want to maybe touch on like maybe what were some of those experiences like in the city or in the Bay Area. Do you remember utilizing resources in the Bay and maybe how it inspired the work you do now? Anything that has the mayor's office in front of it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm suspect of, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, um, <laughs> why don't you talk about your activism in the Tenderloin? Oh, no. We can talk about, yeah, the Tenderloin is, is, I'm sure most of you know, is 
is uh, one of the last enclaves of working class and poor people in the city. It's uh, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the nation. There's 17 different languages that are spoken there. Spoken there. Uh, it's it's the site of, you know, it includes the, 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 the Compton uh, Cultural District. Um, it's, uh, and it's, it's on the very verge, it's, it's on the very verge of, of being totally just eliminated. You know, it's, uh, as you know, I don't know if you know, but there was something called the Twitter tax break, which brought in all the high-tech companies to, to, to mid-market. Of course, they look across the street and they see, you know, this neighborhood, this vulnerable neighborhood, you know, uh, and, and now we see more and more, you know, up to rich techies moving in there. Apartments there and studios there are, are some of the most expensive in the city. Um, you know, from Boston to Philadelphia to Austin to Tucson to, you know, to, to Los Angeles and, and, to, and to Hayes Valley, it's like we see all these gentrified neighborhoods and they're as bland and as, and, you know, monocultural as any, any suburb. And to think that we would sacrifice a tenderloin just to have another, you know, gentrified neighborhood infuriates me. What else infuriates me is, is like, you know, I've learned that, you know, I, you know I, I've been involved in, in like, movement since, you know, 14, the age of 14, but there's no, uh, you know, segment of the society that is as invisible and voiceless as poor people. You know, in fact, America hates poor people. You know, and it's like, and, 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 and we, we, we ignore them. You know, nevertheless, it's like, if you look at, at any congressional, uh, all the congressional districts, the most progressive, you know, uh, uh, members of Congress come from, uh, from areas that have a large concentration of, of, of poor and, and people of color. You know, we, as we said, you know, you know scattering these neighborhoods that were, or destroying these neighborhoods, you know, there, there, there has been a shift to, to the right. If you look at Houston, it used to be Barbara Jordan, and it was Mickey Lee, and now it's Sheila Lee Jackson. You know, it's like there's a shift to the right as, as the demographics change in these neighborhoods. You know, if I can, if I can say, I mean, if I can, you know, Say something tonight about that, that would convince you to, to, you know, that we have to preserve, you know, working class neighborhoods in the city. You know, not, not just because, you know, we need, you know, people need housing, but because it, we, it's, it, that is the heart of San Francisco. The way the tenderloin goes is, is the way San Francisco will go. And so anyway, anything you can do to support that. You know. So um, my, I have a follow-up question to you, which is, I know we. Um, we did a lot of work together, right. and a lot of it is based in anger and, and, and <laughs> having a real clear focus in terms of like uh, injustice and um, and knowing our value right. and knowing that we deserve not not only survival because that's just the minimum. I I need to be able to walk out of my building and not be fucking killed. That's just the minimum. But um, I. I am a beautiful fucking monster. And like we, I, my role is to make sure that you, as a beautiful monster, have, you have the space to flourish and do your fucking weird ass things that you're gonna do, write your poetry, organize, <laughs> do trip out, and, and then that you, we connect with each other and we're able to like come back and, and love. So my question to you is, um, there's like, like the forces that keep atoms together, the things that keep us going, like what is it that um, takes you from a place of anger to a place of hope to being able to do this work? Um, who said I was hopeful? <laughs> 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 You're so <cute. laughs> We do the work we do in order to, to build community. Not because we think we're going to win, because we often don't. But, but in the process of fighting, we build community and we build and we, and we start putting things in place for the future. You know, and we start putting things in place for the future. You know, we, we learn, you know, we, we learn lessons, or we we're, we're an example to people who will follow us. Um, I'm not, you know, believe it or not, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. I, I, until the day they, 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 you know, put me in a wood box and send me back to Texas, I'm going to be optimistic about, about our future. I believe in, in people. I, I really do. I believe. I, I believe. In, I believe that eventually, given the right information, given the right circumstances, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, be, we'll act in the right ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, 
Yes. Okay. Um, I think that a, a lot of my organizing um, has been done because of grief. Um, because my friends have been murdered, um, something has been taken away. You know, like it's it's anger, um, but I think also it's it's the trauma that um, fuels that anger for me. And so, you know, in, in thinking about how do I cope with this trauma, how do I cope with um, my friends being murdered, my friends being attacked on the streets, my friends being denied health care, my friends being denied, you know, vital services. Which happens less now, thankfully, uh, but it still happens. Um, I, you know, I, it's really difficult. It's been difficult for me as as I'm aging to want to continue to do all this shit. Um, you know, to 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 want to be in you know so deep in communities that experience so much because I I have a lot of protection myself in a lot of ways. I have white skin privilege. You know, I am masculine identified. Um, I am. I mean, I think I'm visibly trans, but if you don't know what a trans guy looks like, one would not think that I'm trans. Um, and so, you know, all, all of that, um, all of the ways that I am privileged, you know, serves to protect me from a lot of things that um, my my deep familia and community really experience all the time. Um, and for me, what I've discovered as a way to keep myself going is to to do something else <laughs> with my time that is not related to that, and that is for me. And that is from my healing, and that's how I came to dance. Um, you know, I, I I came to dance because, it, well, I, I started dancing because I went through this tragic, totally terrible divorce. Gay divorce is the worst. It's so worse than straight divorce. Um, and possibly my gay divorce was the worst of all. <laughs> um, and and you know, I was like, fuck, I, I need to do something for myself to feel okay. You know, I, I need to be happy with my life. I need to, you know, and I was like going to all these meetings, you know, trying to get the city to give trans people more money. This is before the Office of Transgender Initiatives, and I know all the truth made behind all of that stuff. You know, like, it's, it, you know, it, it's exhausting. And for me, it's been so important to have something that I can go to that that is connected to, to everything else that I'm doing, but that is also just, you know, healing and grounding for me, and that's, that's what I find in dance. Can you describe the group and what it does? The sure. Group? Yeah, I'm not with them anymore. But okay. um, yeah, In La Cash Dance Academy is a queer, trans, and allied dance academy um, that is based out of Oakland, California. And so, you know, their their focus is really on um, creating spaces that queer, trans people feel like they can connect to Latin dance, specifically salsa and bachata. Um, because all of the other spaces that exist in, in terms of like where to go dancing and where, where to have Latin dance are super straight. Um, I have been queer for, um, whoa, I've been queer for half my life. I just realized that before you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and like I have never, I don't go to straight clubs. Like, you know, I came out before I was 21, like before I was 21, so like I didn't spend time in straight clubs. You know, like I was never a marina girl. You know, so I, like now in doing this dance thing, there's like I have to go to straight clubs if I want to dance. And it, like the first time I went, I was like, oh shit, there's so weird. There's all these boys dancing with girls, and I can't handle it. You know, and it's just like incredibly overwhelming. I like I'm like, you know, how am I gonna go to the bathrooms? The, there's sometimes the, stall, the doors on the stalls don't work. Um, you know, like I, and it's not like I can like have a friend who's usually female stand in front of me in the men's bathroom stall. You know, like, it's, it's this really intensely gendered um, art form, right, that uh, now as I'm getting to know people in the dance community here locally, um, because I have friends and because I know all of the directors from all of the academies, um, I, like, I have that protection now as well. Um, but it's, you know, it was very difficult at first. And I think that what In La Cash Dance did um, they, they, they've just turned two years old, three years old, I'm bad at this, two years old, <laughs> um, it, you know, is it, really create that space for folks. Um, and uh, they created that space for me, and then I was able to then leave, and I'm being taught by a straight instructor now who is a really, in, you know, 
she has so many medals and she's fantastic and she yells at us and she hits us <laughs> and it's fantastic. I'm just like, can I give you a whip and I'll just be a better dancer. <laughs> So um, I'll touch a little bit on Shane, what we talked about, you started this, this round with. Um, so for me, I think a part of disrupting systems have been to learn the systems and try to like figure out how to navigate them because people don't want us to figure that shit out, right? And I also feel like kind of touching on the hope part as well, I, I think I continue to have hope because I've been rescued by so many different chosen families. I've been rescued by services that are provided. I am here because of those things and so, um, when things get really tough, one of the things that I like to remind myself are to like turn back to youth, because I've also served as a, a theater teacher um, on the west side of San Antonio, where I've now witnessed many groups of students go on to do some amazing things, and I see them self-organizing, I see themselves expressing themselves, I see themselves leaning into the tools that were taught to me by my mentors that I've been able to pass on to them, so I kind of feel like and also as a poet, I also feel like there will always be a romantic part of my heart that just dreams of something better. And I think as artists, us being able to take shit and turn it into beauty, I think is a superpower. And I kind of feel like I understood that was my calling from the beginning. You know, for me as an artist, I, I learn all of the skills it takes, whether it means writing grant proposals, whether it means understanding the extractive systems that funding then put upon artists and how we report back and how, you know, what we can and cannot do with the funds that we're given, right? Um, and so there was a long time that I found Chosen Family because I was really resentful that my actual familia forced me to go to business school and didn't let me go to theater school like I had wanted. And um, I was really angry for a long, long time. And then when I realized now at 36 years old, I, I don't need anyone. I can apply for my own funding, I can write my own press releases, I run my own social media platform, I sew my clothes, I take $7 fabric and I make myself look like an 80s like preacher's wife all the time. And, you know, those are, that's, that I think to me, um, when I don't have hope, I, I, I create it. I draw it, you know, and I feel a huge part of, I feel what will liberate us and move us on to the next step of this revolution relies heavily on those of us who can see something that's not there right now and be able to move us and inspire us to get to that place until it is a reality. I didn't realize we were talking about hope, but anyway, I do want to say that, like, if we, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it's like it, 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 it kind of is little encampments of like you know cardboard and dirty blankets and stuff like that. You know, I think that's where the equivalent of what used to be the, the, the Christian hermit saints, you know, um, are today. I, mean, I think someday we'll look back and, and we'll realize that, that that these things are homey and they're, and they're, and and, um, and and we'll, we'll we'll realize what they in fact what they really meant. What things? The, the, like the, the, the tent, all the people who are living in tents nowadays, uh, or some old lady who's sharing her, fruit, her food with, with, with a bunch of sparrows, you know, it's just like that. You know, one thing the tent owners taught me is that people are incredibly generous. Even when they're poor, even when they're poor, even when they're out there at their works, people are incredibly generous and incredibly caring, and that gives me hope. So, um, I will, this is, um, in, in many ways, I set up, I have to admit, I set up this event for shame because Shane, um, because Shane is an, a, a newer part of my chosen family, and I wanted to make sure that, that you had a chance to meet um, some of us, and to connect with us, and, and I think what I'm, um, what I'm realizing is that I, need, I want to share a little bit more personal stuff, and let you know that, um, so, um, I'm a big monstra, and like, <laughs> we're all big monstras here, monstros, and, but I want to call out in particular that um, some of my heroes and heroes, and that Jesse is one of them. And Jesse and I used to live together, we've had many fights, we, there were years <laughs> we did not talk, but, and we've competed as writers, and sometimes I'm the better fucking writer, sometimes he's the better fucking writer, and we've done, organize, we both organized and produced and all that jazz, and, 
and sometimes he's more lefty than me, and vice versa, <laughs> whatever. But um, what, it re what I really want to share, and this is for you, Shane, I think, that um, uh, at the most vicious moments of our experiences, when I was not sure what to do, or who, like how I was going to get out of this, like, hour, like, oh, shit, this is, I'm in a moment of extreme violence, I don't know what's going to happen, am I going to, am I going to get through this, it was this bitch, and it, it was my sister and my partner in crime, who I could call, at, like, strung out, I'm a pro, I'm legit now, I'm polished, whatever, I'm executive realness, because I'm the chair of a motherfucking board. However, however, that does not change that I've done mountains of drugs, and <laughs> they were not drugs that are legalized right now. So um, that is just me being real. And like me as an older queer, that's somebody that I'm connecting with you, is to say that, um, you know, we're human and that you have a long path up ahead of you. The path can go many different ways, up and down, it's not linear, it's not, um, in many ways, it's not even chronological, it's almost like there are loops and cycles and things that happen that you, where you find yourself in situations or places and asking yourself, how did I get here, how do I get out? So I think on a basic level, what I wanna share with you is, you, I know you have a mother, that Donna's your mom and that um, I am a part of the, an extended family too, and that um, like Colette is my, one of my queer mothers. And, but what I will say is um, get a sister. Get a sister like Jesse James Johnson <laughs> that you can call in the middle of the night when shit has gone down. And all you know is you need to not be where you're at and you need a place to go and they're not gonna judge you for you having been up too fucking long, and for you to like making bad choices with the men in your life, and, the, and, and they might even say, you know what, you need my room more than I need my room. <laughs> <laughs> Which is literally what happened. <laughs> and and, and uh, so, like all of the abstract concepts of like community and love, and then they're real, it's real. But I, I do want to impart with you, like you, not only do you need a mother, you need aunties, I'm an auntie, but um, a, a, a few sisters, a few hardcore sisters, like Jesse James Johnson. Embrace the grotesque, the pornographic, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and poverty, you know, and how uh, uh, that those things manifest in your life as well. Don't be afraid of those things. So, um, absolutely. Yes, I'm working on building my family, and that's kind of one of the big things I've learned with the projects we've collaborated on, like uh, Chosen Familias, you know. Um, as queer people, we get to choose our family, you know. Um, it's the experience of, you know, sometimes it's really rough, you know, that you are ostracized from the people you have titled family that are your blood, and then you go out in the world and you search, you know search for connection, belonging, uh, the desire to feel human. Um, and this project that we did, Chosen Familias, the exhibition that's outside, absolutely reminded me of that. You know, the Bay Area, there's such a hustle mentality. You get caught up, you gotta wake up, you gotta do this next, you gotta turn in this paper, you gotta write this email. And when I was invited to this project, it was a real invitation to stop, pause, and go through photos. You know, photography has been an art form um, in human society for a long time, and what it does is it documents, it paints a picture, it uh, can trigger a memory, and it did that for me. You know, it, it made me realize, wow, I am so blessed to have people in my life that I connect to, and wonderful people, you know, people who are performers, people who are, you know, fighting the fight for different communities um, but also those people that, you know, they, they see me, you know, they see me. And that's so um, important for 
you know, not only the work I do, you know, whether it's related to trans issues, but just existing. You know, life can get tough, and I'm sure we all know that in one way or another. But if we have someone to share that experience with, like those people that you call family, I, I know no other happiness, honestly. Whether it's just waking up in the morning, like, hey girl, you want eggs? Yeah. <laughs> that experience of just being with somebody and sharing the human experience. Um, and that's what this project reminded me of. I was so happy to have something that's physical that if I need to just take that break and pause, I can look and be like, wow, these are the people in my life that are, I, I've chosen. And they've chosen me just as much as it's a, it's a two-way street. 